Without further ado, welcome Ron Cox tonight to the floor. Amen. Oh, wow. Thank you, Pastor. I love you, buddy. You get out my stuff, okay? I was telling people I'm not a very good preacher, but I'm fun to watch. So, watch. Grandma said one picture is worth a, what? We're kin folks. We've got the same grandma. I've always been a preacher that has used pictures. I found out that people will forget 80% of what you preached when they go to the parking lot and put their hand on the doorknob of the car but they will never forget a picture. So I've been a picture man. And um, by the way, do you remember, I'm just warming up here. You remember the story in the Bible where Jesus went to wedding feast and his mother went with him. You know that story. And uh, they ran out of wine. And the uh, they came to the mother of Jesus. I said, well, go to him. He can help. How many know when you don't know what the answer is, go to him. He's got the answer. And the, the, it was servants that went to Jesus that carried transformation. Water was transformed in the hands of servants, not the man, the, the governor of the feast, only through servants is God going to transform anything. And then they brought all of that water, and on their way to the governor of the feast, he took it and he drank it. God had transformed it, and he smacked his lips and said, Usually the best wine is given at the first, but you help me preach. You have saved the best wine till I'm not trying to... Everybody says that. Every preacher says that. We parrot what others say more than we know. Every version of the Bible, if it is last, if transformation happens last, somebody define to me when last is. You have a true definition of last? Anybody? Somehow in our minds, the church learns to stay where it is because we've defined things that does not require an action right now. The Bible says you've saved the best wine till now. How many know when now is? Can't you define it more than last? Read every scripture. You check and see if I'm a false prophet. Every one of them is now. We're going to talk about going the distance. You can put off transformation till last if you don't know when it is. But you cannot put off if you know that it's now. Do you understand? God, the only moments that I have to give to God is now. How many know he's a present help in the time of need? We want him to come. We're looking for him. Have you ever seen those chart preachers? They bring out those charts and you know automatically they know more when Jesus is coming than God does or Jesus himself. But listen to me. I, I, I just know this. I've lived my life in the now needing God's help for the next step that I take. We're going to talk about going the distance for real freedom. I can't tell you how to not live without pain. I have not learned that. I'm not magnifying pain. I hate it. How many like pain? If you do, you really need deliverance. I can't tell you. Oh, by the way, this is kind of a side note, but let me tell you, it's your fault because you folks are so receptive. I feel this. <clears throat> if life, 
that you live in that I live were, were a audio recording, how would life sound if it was an audio recording? I'm going to give it to you. You ready? Oh, this is so profound and deep. <laughs> yeah, well. Have you, how many ridden a roller coaster? Let me see your hand. Not just kids. Come on, Dad, Grandpa. You had to with your grandkids, right? Okay, the first sound is this. Click, 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 click. Which way are you going when you hear click? Name it. See, you're helping me preach. When you're going up, it, you hear the clicking sound because that means life is clicking when you're going up. How many know on a roller coaster when you reach the top, which way are you now going? Down. The second sound of life is this. Ah! Here's the audio recording of life. Don't forget that this is so deep, Pastor. Here it is. Click, click. Ah! Click, click. Ah! Click, click. Ah! Don't believe these preachers that tell you that it's going to be all honey, no bees, no work, and all ease. Hold on to your billfold very tightly. That deserves more of a praise God. I can't tell you how to escape life's pains and how not to fail, but I can tell you how not to quit. And if you don't quit, even though you might not understand it and life hands you some blank spaces, don't pick up your own pen and write in them. You won't like what you write. Don't take control of the blank spaces. Let him write. Dip his pen in the inkwell of his blood and write in your blank spaces. The old timers used to call it, keep on the keeping on. Listen, I think... I think we often blame God for not coming through for us when in reality all we did was quit. We simply just did nothing that caused us to stare at our unstopped potential and our unseized opportunities. There's preachers across this country, we travel everywhere, that are going through some real tough stuff. I love preachers. But sometimes a lot of our pain simply comes to us because we just quit and didn't believe God through the deepest part. How many believe He will never leave us nor forsake us? He will come through. Living safe. Now, I told you the other day I'm a little tweetable, so you can tweet some things if you want. But living average and safe may protect you from risk. It really can protect you from some risk or greater disappointments or pain, but it also can separate you from a future of greatness that God has for you. I'm not going to quit, are you? Refuse to settle. Refuse to settle. The ones who have the most difficulty in settling is people like my age. Don't settle. We've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. These wonderful young children need us to come alive to everything that's inside of us. Now listen to me. Don't underestimate what God has for you. I'm going to talk tonight just simple. But we're going the distance for real freedom. We're going the distance on the inside. What you long for may not just happen tonight in the service, but you're, you're going to make a decision to go the distance. You're, you're not going to stare across Jordan. We're going to decide to go across it. What is going the distance for freedom? It's an, it's an inner determination. 
to, ri to raise the bar of your faith in God, your sacrifices for God, and your expectations in God. I'm not, I'm going to tell you what. I found out to you, to you younger folks, I I've got the definition to spiritual maturity. You want to know what it is? It's not realizing how much you know. It's realizing how little you know. I have discovered in the area, we've got so much in ministry today. we got books on how to do everything. My greatest problems in life have not been when I drew a blank space. It's when I felt like I knew exactly what to do all the time. And I trusted in myself and the arm of flesh instead of God himself. Write this down. Do not lower your expectations to protect your disappointments. Did you hear me? Don't lower your expectations to protect your... That's what we do in church. We come with lowered expectations. And we don't even know it. And here's what we say. I'd like to believe God for that preacher, but I tried it one time, and it didn't work. What if God doesn't come through for me? <laughs> what if he does? What if tonight not a one of us left here the same that we came? It's worth it. It's worth, don't lower your internal expectations. I told, the, told us this morning, most of us know how to do church with our eyes closed. We got church down. But we don't have him down. He's filled with surprises. An inner determination to rise and believe God. The Bible is filled with divine encounters that people in hopeless situations who had no earthly horizontal answers for, hopeless that they had with Jesus. Listen to me. How you, you mentioned this this morning, how you perceive God affects everything that you do in life. You always need to say, God, let me not create a definition of who you are in the inside of me if it is not true to who you really are. If you see God as harsh, selective, wearing a halo, far removed from the reality of everyday living, if you see God as legalistic, I was raised in a very legalistic, harsh, inner-city life without a father on welfare. My mom sought God, but she loves him. She's home. But I saw God as cranky, as somebody with a big stick, that you could never please him. There's a song Beautiful song, I don't know who it's from, but it went like this. From a distance, he's watching you. Oh, it's beautiful. Sometimes untruths come in such a beautiful melody. From a distance, he's watching me. He's a very present help in the time of need. How many know he's here? He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He is here, the very breath that I breathe. He occupies my own being. You'll never take the journey of healing or deliverance or freedom unless you believe in the true concept of God. You'll live your life always striving, but never arriving. You are, right now, what you settle for. You said, I haven't settled. Let me tell you about my own life right now, where I'm at. 
I'm hungrier right now for God than I've ever been in my entire life. I've been a preacher for 52 years. But I am so hungry for God. That's all I've got. Is that not spiritual enough? Do you need a greater answer than that? I'm the wrong guy. Live your life striving but never arriving. You are what you settle for. You, it's easy to come into a Pentecostal church and settle on the inside. There's preachers who have settled. They love God, yes, but they've settled. How do you pierce through that? Only he can do that. Your, write this down, your today's complacency will become tomorrow's captivity. Wherever you are complacent, tomorrow it will become a captivity. This is no day. The latter shall be greater than the past. Aren't you glad you came? <laughs> We will create our own limits, our justifiable space. You mentioned something like this this morning. We will stare spiritually from the base of the mountain, and we'll look up its, to its peak, and we say, here's where I live. But I wonder what it would be like to be on the peak of this mountain and feel the unrestricted breezes blow but yet we remain at the base. Not because God doesn't want to lift us up, but because we have allowed that space to be created. Always making God a little smaller than our biggest problem. I can always tell you can talk to God's children and I've, when they're going through a struggle, their problems are always expressed as bigger than when God smooths their territory about their excitement and largeness of God. The problem is always larger. Don't make the problem you're going through bigger than God. God is bigger than anything you would ever think about going through. Now listen. We're going the distance in a few minutes. I'm not saying just all of a sudden there's a magic golden key, but I want God to touch you from the person here that may be the closest to God to the one that's saying, my God, there's a bunch of distance between me and God. Listen. Listen. I don't want to end my life with echoes going through my mind of what should have been, could have been, might have been, ought have been, would have been. Did you know that 80% of self-talk, you know what self-talk is? It's when you, not audibly, you, I, I, I'm getting at the age where I audibly talk to myself, that's not good. But on the inside, 80% of all self-talk is negative. How many believe that you do have power through Jesus to turn that kind of talk around? If God can't touch you where you cannot touch, then why are we here? Huh. Listen to me. Many people don't worship God as he is. They worship God. Their concept that they have created of God. Based, you know what they base it on? What they're going through. If I'm in pain, then God is smaller. You heard a little bit of our testimony today. <laughs> I'm not here to, a lot of people have been through struggles. 
The Bible is filled with stories of people who refused to stay where they were. How many believe that there's a power of God that's available to you tonight that you don't have to stay where you are? You don't have to. We're creating church so mechanical today. I don't believe in sloppy agape. We had, we, we had these big, huge ceilings, and we now got the, uh, the, the oldest master's commission in the country. I was one of the first what they call contemporary preachers, but the contemporary has now become the traditional. All churches are doing the same thing. But it takes more. I love the external, how you do church. I'm glad for a, a padded chair. I've sat on those benches when I started the preaching. And somebody had sat next to me and they thought I got blessed and I jumped up. Whoop! All they did was is it pinched me when they sat down. The boards. I'm glad for the new stuff. The old preachers, look, I'm singing off the wall. I almost lost my life taking an attendance board off the wall of a church. <laughs> you all said, what are you talking about? You're fortunate. <laughs> I was one of many that started that stuff. <laughs> People in the Word of God who decided violating all societal standards and exclusions to enter into the space of Jesus. I'm not going to stay tonight where I am. I'm going to make a decision that my life is going to be different and this church is going to be different. And let it rain, Lord. I know what you're thinking about. The Syrophoenician woman breaking all laws you remember that story? She was willing to be seen as a dog eating crumbs from the table to appeal to Jesus to touch and deliver her demon-possessed little girl. The religion said, don't you go to him. What are you talking about? I've got a problem that only he can solve. Get out of my way. A woman with the issue of blood, yet it was not societally correct. She crawled on the ground, breaking through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. Who touched me? Peter's stepping out of the boat because he got tired of boat talk. Meh, 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 meh. The prodigal son, he said, I will. I'm done. I will arise and go to my father. An outcast of outcast. We're going to talk for a few minutes on just one focused story on what I talked about. And we're going to look at some scriptures in just a few minutes, and I'll, I'll have you guys bring it up. But going the distance, if you'll put that up there, for real freedom. Going the distance for real freedom. Let's focus. Mark 1, verse 40. Just look up here. It starts off by saying, a man with leprosy or a man full, full of leprosy came to Jesus. A man full of leprosy. In other words, there was nothing, no space in him that was available for anything else but something that was trying to take his life. He was full. Of, he had practiced leprosy for a long time. He had been in the struggle a long time. It wasn't a spot. He was full of leprosy. Can a man that is terminal make a decision to come to Jesus? Listen to me. The Word of God tells us very little about, about this guy. Listen. He was so hopeless he couldn't get worse. He was full of leprosy. 
Josephus said it was like a living death. In India, you and I, the little lepers would knock on the side of your windows of the car. This leper, who was the subject of one of the very first miracles in the Bible, it doesn't even notice. There's one thing that is absent. He doesn't even give us his name. His name is now gone by what he was going through. Beaumont, Texas. We were there in a meeting. Melanie and, and Kevin. Thank you back there. We were sitting. What do men know about, or even want to be in a mall? Melanie and her were on a mission. They were shopping. They left us at the place called Dippin' Dots. <laughs> Kevin was standing. I was looking around. Men of God in a mall. I saw two chairs that you put a dollar in for massage. My body's old. I didn't know this. I said, Kevin, I got a few bucks. Let's sit down. The chairs look so comfortable. I'll put in. We can get us a little massage here. Two preachers, men of God, sitting at by Dippin' Dots. When that thing started, you talk about feeling like a holy roller. I, I said, this hurts. He said, it's worse than that. It's killing me. A young generation came by, muscle guy. He walked by, had a backpack on his back, and he's moving like this. He stopped and he looked at me and said, does that hurt? I jumped up and said, yeah, young dude, it hurts. Not you, muscle man. He looked at me and a tear came in his eyes in the mall. He said, you don't have any idea how bad I hurt. I said, come here and talk to me. What are you talking about? I saw the bracelet where the ho there's a hospital next door to the mall, and he splits through and uses the parking deck. And he said, I I I'm dealing with cancer. But he said, that's not my problem. That's a piece of cake. I said, cancer is not your problem? What is your problem? He said, I'm a meth addict, and so is my, my fiance that we had a baby with, and she just sold our little baby for enough money to get a meth fix, and I don't know where she is. And we sit in the church as though things are normal. She knows this. There's not a day. Kevin. We prayed for him, he gave his life to Christ. I prayed for his healing, and I said to Kevin, son, listen to me. Do you believe that I'll forget you? I'm going to pray for you. Do you he said, somehow I know that everybody will forget me, but somehow looking into your eyes, I don't believe you'll ever forget me. Every day of my life, I'm not trying to elevate myself, but it keeps me in touch with the broken world. I pray for David. Lord Jesus, wherever David lives in this area, would you touch David? Touch David. We have not because we ask not. You can preach on prayer, but it's time that we prayed. His identity was swallowed up by his condition. What he was going through, if we're not careful, we can become more identified by what we're going through than who we have the potential to become. Difficulties and issues can so consume you that you, they become who you are, not who he says you are. Somehow you can sit into this service 
and you can feel as an unqualified candidate if this church people really knew I'm here and I'm on a journey, but oh God, if they really knew what was going on inside of me. The Bible says, speaking about how easy it is to become, he talked about Israel, you become as a wild bull. Bull. I was in Africa. They had to, we, to go to our room. There was a Cape buffalo. You don't mess with Cape buffaloes. Huge potential. It said a wild bull caught in a net. Isn't it unbelievable the possibility of such potential and power was not caught or trapped behind a concrete wall or a steel iron fence? Just a net. The enemy. What is the net about? I'll tell you what it is. And if we compromise in the church today and we say nobody's perfect, I got this going on in my life, but, you know, it's not that much. Nobody's going to, nobody's perfect. I'm going to deal with this. See the enemy, you say to yourself, look, I can take that anger or I can take that other thing and I can, I can snap it in a minute. It's no big deal. But wait a minute. Here's what the enemy does. He adds one strand that you refuse to come clean with before God. And before long, he'll add something else to it. And then he'll add something else to it. Until finally, I tell you what the devil is. He's good at unrepented sins of tying knots to the other sin that you have not yet gotten free from, and you become entrapped in a net. Keep a short sin account. I, I worry sometimes that we've taken God's grace as though he's cut us slack to keep all kinds of strands around us, you're not that strong. If a wild bull can be caught in the net, so can you. Listen to me. Listen. There's something inside of us. This, this leper... Leviticus 13, by the way, Leviticus 13, it reads, it, ooh, have you read it? That's why a lot of people don't read the Word of God. Uh, it's like reading a dermatology manual. <laughs> ugh. Well, I don't think I'll read the Bible much anymore after I get through Leviticus instead of devotional book. But even religion without compassion in it will tell the leper how he needs to respond. What he is on the inside, he needs to express and look like on the outside. What you need to do is tear your clothes. Then you need to dishevel your hair. And then you need real people who've got it together. Say that's you folks. Here's what it is. I've got some stuff going on in me. I'm sitting in this church pew, but I feel a distance. I wish that I was as close to God as the preacher is. They said, announce what you are. I'm unclean. You church people, I've got to stay 50 feet away from you. You deserve to be touched by God, but not me. And then they said, take a bell, an old rusty bell. Let's just see. I told you a picture. I'm coming through, y'all. I'm contagious. But I'm coming through. I'm going to ring my bell and I'm going to announce I'm unclean. I've got to get 50 feet away from you. I'm unclean! I'm unclean! I'm unclean! I'm unclean! I'm unclean! I could go across the street. My condition can make me sit in church, but I feel like I'm in the parking lot. Because 
I don't have a name anymore. I'm not talking about just sin. I'm talking about sometimes Christians battle a lot of stuff and make them feel at a distance. Now I'm going to show you something, and then I'm closing. So simple. It is so, so simple. There's always a great temptation to over-identify with our weaknesses or our strengths. I've seen more preachers fail in their strengths than they ever fell in their weaknesses. By what I have or don't have, the size of my church or not the size of my church, what I can do or can't do, what I've done or haven't done. And the church is eat up with two things called guilt and shame. Let me tell you the difference. Guilt and shame have a voice. Guilt that is not dealt with turns into shame. Here's what guilt says. You need to come and start seeking me, letting me deal with everything. You come to me regardless of where you are. Take the 50-foot pace and come, and you move into my presence because I'm here to touch you and to change you. Guilt says, you did that! You ever had that happen? You did that! You know you did that! You ever had that voice? And then suddenly, the guilt, if it's not dealt with, it turns to shame. Here's the voice of shame. Are you ready? Shame says, not you only did that. Shame says, here it is, you are what you did. But the truth is, you are not what you did. There's a fountain filled with blood. Flown, if God cannot remove your sin, why are we here? You are not what you did. All this past, new has come. Then we live in criticism and competitiveness. Neither one are good. Because one makes you better than someone else, and the other one makes you worse than somebody else. But you know the real problem with that? The real problem is the enemy removes from you the right to have the power to change who you are. You only consider who other people are and their faults. I'm either better than you are or I'm worse than you are. But I neglect who I am. That's the problem with church and criticisms in churches. It keeps you from seeing who you are. Listen to the old guy. Listen to me. He said, I'm going the distance. He lived life removed and marginalized. The tears that that leper shed. See, as a couple, you don't ever have to cry anymore by yourself. You have other people that will help wipe your tears away. That's the power of the church. He had to wipe his own tears away. But one day, we're going to go through it. And then God is going to touch us. It quarantined this man to living a life removed. I was a little welfare kid in Indianapolis. My dad was a World War I veteran. World War I. My mom was later on in life. His first wife had died. Mom was in her late 30s. When she married him, he was older than that. They wasted no time, and they had five children within eight or nine years. One, one of them was a set of twins. My dad, in those days, they did not diagnose it, Vietnam vet. They didn't have any real diagnosis. They called it shell shock. My dad literally reenacted war inside of his mind over and over until it drove him literally 
crazy. My brother the other day at 80 years old told me as a 10-year-old boy how he used to beat on dad because of the, the abuse that he gave to mama. My dad was, was carried off to a mental ward in some distant place. Mom was left with four children and she was pregnant with the fifth with no husband. And to add insult to injury, you talk about a condition. Tuberculosis. She was diagnosed with tuberculosis. It was deadly. Her face was swelled. She had tuberculosis and was pregnant. I had an aunt, Aunt Teresa. Aunt Teresa believed in anointed prayer claws, and she was one that believed if a little oil would really help, a whole bottle on you would really help you. Mama was not a Christian, but Aunt Teresa came to Mama and said, I believe, Hannah, I've heard from God. If you'll put this prayer cloth over you, when, when, when the foster care comes to take all the children away and take you and the baby to the uh, sanatorium, that I believe you can demand another test because I believe if you'll put this prayer cloth on your head, God will heal you in the night. Mama was not a Christian. She was angry. She cursed that. But she put it in desperation. She put it on her face as the oil dripped down her ears. She got up in the morning and the swelling was gone. She demanded a test. They took her off to the sanatorium. They could not find any tuberculosis. Now, the reason why I tell you that story and the reason why I believe in divine healing is I was healed before I was born. I was the child inside a mother that was healed before I was born. Now, let's look at it. Now, a leper says, I'm through with the bell. No more bell ringing. Old is gone. No more bell ringing. I'm going to Jesus regardless of what. They say I can be stoned to death. I got 50 paces. He's been going through those towns. I've seen him from a distance long enough. I want to see him up close. I'm going to go the distance for real freedom. They may stone me. I would rather die in a puddle of my own blood than to stay where I am. I'm going to take the steps necessary. This church is going to become what God called it to be. I'm going to take them. The first step is the hardest. Here it is. Go with me just a few more minutes. Forty-nine. I found out something. If you're really desperate to go to Jesus, he will protect you from the stones of those who want to keep you from getting there. 48, 47, 6, 30. I've never been this close to a man. I've never seen in a person's eyes. Look at them eyes. He's full of leprosy. His eyes may have been gone. Maybe not. But he said, look, I, I'm looking at him. I think that he may be looking at me. Nobody's looked at me before. But he's looking at me. He's looking at me. Now the leper came to him, imploring him. Oh, all of a sudden, within five steps, a dream comes in him. I remember leaving my little girl when she was a baby. I'm dreaming. I think if I get to him, I'm going to hug my little girl again. How desperate are you for more than what you have? Implore him. Look at this. Kneeling down to him. Notice this. He got in a posture of worship before he got in a posture of asking God for anything. 
God is tired of us only coming to him for us, for him to fix our problems. He wants you to come to him in worship. Kneeling down. Say, if you're willing. He, he didn't doubt that God could. All of us know he can. But will you? Let's change the will. Will of God can be so, let's call it desire. If you desire to help me, God, as a preacher, taking my little bride all of those years in a wheelchair, and I'm preaching on divine healing, and the enemy's saying, you liar, she can't, your own wife can't be healed. And I'd preach and look down at her twisted in a wheelchair for 25 years. And God builds a church. I've had young preachers come to me and say, tell me the strategy. I said, you don't want my strategy. I just took a step at a time trusting that God was going to see me through. If that's not enough for you, you're too deep for me. If you're willing, or if you desire, next verse, then Jesus moved with compassion. How many know he will always be moved? Oh, we need a move of God. Well, they go the distance. We want God to do stuff without us making choices. We've learned how to spiritually moonwalk. We point our feet in the right direction. We know how to do it. But at the same time, we're doing this. Oh, well, that guy loves God because his feet are pointed toward him. <laughs> yeah, well. Now look, what does it say next? He, had, he stretched what? What did he do? He touched him. Was he healed? No! Oh, my God. You mean God will reach down and touch me before he heals me? Yes. He was touched with the feelings of your infirmity. He will reach down and touch. Can't you imagine a man never been touched? He's down here in worship posture, not in possession posture, looking into his chestnut eyes, and he reaches down and puts his hand on the nastiness of his flesh. Look at it. And he said to me, I am willing. Now he cleansed him. I think that guy, here's what happened to me when I came to Jesus. I couldn't believe that he would touch me while I was still in my pains and my sufferings and my sin. He gave me affirmation before he gave me healing. He affirmed me, and then he healed me. Aren't you glad he picked you up where you are? He reached out, and he touched you. Please look at it. I'm willing. Be clean. Next verse. As soon as he spoke and needed the lepers, he left him. And he was cleansed. Pentecostals want to go right there. No, no, no. There were steps before that. Next. And he strictly. Now here's the deal right here, guys. He warned him. Sent him away and said, what? Don't you tell anybody. Give me a break. I'm a leper, and I get set free, and I'm going home to a daughter, and you told me not to tell nobody. Did you know he told that to a lot of people? And every person he told it to broke their promise. No one of them told it, wouldn't you? Why did he say that? Don't tell anybody. Offer yourself and go through the deal. Next verse, 45. The next verse, please. However, I may like howevers. However, he went out and blah, blah, blah. That's me. That's me. 
Not you. You'd keep the promise. Mums is the word. You remember that leper? Oh, no, I don't know. Who, who are you talking about? He proclaimed it freely. Why did Jesus ask him not to tell anybody? Listen to me. Because Jesus came for a greater mission than even healing that man of leprosy. And he knew that if every person, he came more than just to fix your life here. He came to prepare you for there. We, our famous words in the church is, my name is Jimmy. I'll take all you give me. How many want to be fixed for there more than you want God to meet a need for here? That doesn't mean he won't do it. But what happened finally? This is it. Jesus could no longer, because he told it, could no longer openly enter into the city. But he went outside. Wait a minute, that's just where the leper came from. The leper came from the desert. He came from the desert and went into the city. Jesus had to come from the city. Do ministry from the... So really, did the leper come to Jesus? <laughs> Jesus exchanged places with him. He brought me out of the desert and let me go into the city. And he went to the desert for me. He became sin. Who knew? No. Sin. Listen to me. One more little thing, and I want you to, this is it. My little granddaughter said, Paul, Paul, you said, and in closing, in closing, she said, I heard you, I counted today, my little smart aleck granddaughter. She said, I counted how many times you said in closing. She said, you said in closing seven times today in your sermon. Thank you. She said, then she said, how many doors do you have on that sermon? <laughs> in closing, there was a man named William Culper who had an immoral past. He was going to be elected as a clerk of a house over in London, and he wanted the job, but he knew if his past got out that he would not be qualified. He became so ashamed that it drove him to fear. He became suicidal. He tried to drink poison. and it, You know you're in bad shape when you try to kill yourself, and you can't. Suzanne, God took care of you. He trembled so much he dropped the poison and it just broke the glass bottle. He put a rope on a beam. I'm not kidding you. He put a rope on a beam, put his neck around it, and the stupid beam broke. He took a knife, cut himself, and the blade broke. One morning, so emotionally exhausted, William Culper went to bed said, I can't even kill myself. I feel so far removed and so distant. A melody came. How many know God gives songs in the night? Do you believe it? And he began to hear just faintly. I want you to listen to it. He began to faintly hear this melody. Let's listen to it. I promise you I'm through. What is that? It became a little bit louder. It came louder and suddenly there, there came a hope. I can go the distance. He got up. He said, I got to put some words to that. With 
tears coming down his face, he took his pen and he wrote these words. There is a fountain filled with blood. Flowed from, flowed from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the flood. Lose all their guilty stain. Lose all their guilty stain. The dying thief rejoiced to see the fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed ones of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, the flowing wounded side provide, redeeming love has been my theme. And it shall be till I die. And it shall be till I die. It shall be till I die. Thank you. You can fade that out for a moment, would you? Leprosy is not just gross sin. It's whatever is eating away at you. That's taking away God's best from you. From this church. From me as your speaker. I've asked the Lord. I asked the Lord. Jesus, I really want to see you put on display. Not for human aggrandizement. I'm so sick. I've watched God do some great moves of God in the past, and I've watched preachers steal the glory of it from the God. And I'm sick of it. Sick of it. God wants His church back. And I'll tell you where He wants to start. Not just with the young. wants to start with us. I want the latter days to be greater than the past. Now physically, we're not as energetic as we were. So what? Listen to me. I'm talking to this group. Young David came when in to the camp to feed the armies of God. David saw Goliath, a huge, opposing enemy. And David got the Holy Ghost on him, and he was going to defy him. All of God, the, the saints of God, God's older, they were behind the tent flaps. They were through fighting. They were done. David was out there. Goliath kept coming closer and closer. Saul came out. Yes, Saul's going to help him. No, he wasn't. Saul came out. What did he come out for? Armor. He wanted David's victory externally to look just like his looked. Just because the young generation rejects our armor doesn't mean they're rejecting us. You know why I've got to help that young generation over there? Look at me, kids. I'm going to be honest with you. God told me to kill Goliath when he was a baby, and I didn't do it. Now you're facing a giant, and I've got to help you. I don't want a move of God. I hear preachers, the stupidest thing I've heard. I talked to an older person the other day. I was eating lunch. They were on a leadership team of this huge church, and they begin to cry, and they talk about how we need to reach the millennials. That's who we're going to turn this church over. And they begin to cry, where do I fit? That's not God. 
I tell you what generation it is. It's the gen- there's no young generation, medium generation. It's the generation that is alive right now that God wants to use, regardless of your age. You are the generation. Stand with me. I want us to come. All of us. Could you do it? Just all of us come. Come real close. Can I ask something? Would you come please? Just stand here. No, no deal. No deal. Come closer. So there's room there. Now here's here's what I would like. Young generation, would you maybe yes, young generation, would you kind of mingle, come right through with us and mingle over here among us? Come right on over. Older generation, you see a young. We're gonna sing a song. Would you lay hands on one of the young? And let's ask God to touch them as we sing together, there is a fountain.